Welcome to the webinar today, Hail to the New Chief of Data. My name is Stephanie McReynolds, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Alation. And we have with us today Jennifer Bellison, Principal Analyst of Forrester. I am actually going to wait a few minutes. It looks like quite a few attendees are trying to get on the, the line. So I'm going to ask everyone to uh, be patient for another minute or so. Uh, and maybe spend uh, a little bit of time contemplating uh, a little humor to open up the session this morning. Um, I always feel like I should poll folks to see who feels like the baby in the center of this picture. <laughs> um, or maybe you feel more like the adult that's trying to, to watch over an, an organization of uh, new self-service data users. Uh, but enjoy uh, a few minutes of, of humor and we'll uh, just wait for the final attendees to uh, get on to today's webinar before we start. Thank you so much for your time this morning. All right, well, it looks like the on-ramp of attendees maybe has slowed down a little bit, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get, get started. As I mentioned, my name is Stephanie McReynolds, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Alation. And uh, we work with uh, a variety of, of data leaders and, and organizations um, that are engaged in rolling self-service analytics out to their organizations. And it, as advanced as those organizations are, and, and many organizations have become in their use of analytics and data, um, Self-service analytics initiatives often make me feel like this baby in the middle of the <laughs> in the middle of the data library <laughs> here. Um, so today, what we're going to talk about is um, how a chief data officer um, can help uh, mature an organization in its approach to self-service analytics um, and um, across the board uh, turn uh, new users. Uh, of data and data democratization efforts uh, into business impactful decision making and, and competitive ad advantage. Um, and Jennifer Bellison, um, who has joined us uh, for today, has been doing a, a, a quite a bit of research in the area of chief data officers and how their roles are changing in organizations or have changed over the last couple of years. So um, we're excited to delve into today's uh, content. Before we get started, just a couple of um, housekeeping uh, reminders. Um, today's webinar will run about 60 minutes. Um, we are focused today on sharing um, research with you, um, changing trends um, from a Forrester perspective on the role of the Chief Data Officer, and a couple of case studies of how Chief Data Officers are using Alation as a data catalog in their business. Um, we won't be sharing a demonstration of the Alation product today, um, if you are interested in a demonstration, please reach out to us um, on our website, elation.com, which with a request um, to see a demo. We'd be happy to fulfill that, but I wanted to let people know in advance that we have some product screenshots, but this is not a, a product demo. We also encourage folks to ask questions. I'll be monitoring um, the, the tab to your right um, on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, there's a tab that is labeled questions. Um, and if you, you do uh, have a question in the middle of the webinar, please um, type the question in that panel, and I will be uh, looking for opportunities um, as Jennifer and I both present to answer those questions as we, as we go along. So um, please make today's webinar interactive. Um, we also encourage you, if there are interesting observations or trends that we're sharing today, um, to tweet those out to a broader audience. Uh, on uh, Twitter or uh, LinkedIn or a social shared on a social media um, platform of, of your choosing. We'll be using the hashtag data catalog um, and at Alation uh, as our handle here for the, the, the team as we uh, go through today's webinar. Um, also for folks um, who may be watching this after the fact, we are sharing the replay with all the participants today and then we'll be posting the replay on our website for, for sharing after today's uh, event. So uh, we will uh, jump into the, the content now, but if you have any other uh, questions or technical issues, uh, please reach out to us uh, for questions through the questions tab or technical issues through the chat tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. 
So our content providers uh, today, I've given myself a little bit of an inter introduction. Um, not only am I the, the VP of Marketing Adulation, but I have about 20 years of experience um, working primarily with uh, you know, a vendor role in marketing and product management in the data space. Um, and I am pleased today to be joined by Jennifer Bellison. And Jennifer is a principal analyst at Forrester, and her research is focused on the data economy, uh, in particular looking at strategies for developing and delivering data products and services. Um, most recently, what that research has led her um, to spend time with is um, a number of, of chief data officers and some work serving um, chief data officers to find out how that role has changed over the last um, 16 or so, so years. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Jennifer many, many years ago um, in her life before Forrester. Um, before Forrester, she, she did spend eight years in marketing and strategy at Sun Microsystems, but even prior to that, she was a public policy analyst in Russia and Eastern Europe and a graduate student at Stanford University. So our relationship goes way back to Stanford <laughs> University, where our paths crossed. We were both students of uh, Mike McFall, a Stanford professor and former ambassador to Russia. So we'll... We'll try to keep out of the, the presentation today any mention of Russia and bots and fake news, but <laughs> our, uh, our paths certainly did cross in a, in a former lifetime. Um, Jennifer, thrilled to, uh, to be co-presenting with you uh, once again, and uh, I will turn the floor over to you to um, take a look at your insights on uh, data le leadership and chief data officers and what's um, changing today. Perfect. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, yeah, it's really interesting that we have we have this past, um, but let's talk about the present and 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 the future. Um, so, just a quick stage setting. Um, we all know that the market has changed. You know, even we are all different co consumers than we used to be. We're all armed with. Uh, little computers in our pockets, we can get access to information and we have a mechanism to reach out to friends, family and beyond to share our views about things and the, our opinions of the companies and products that we touch on a daily basis. Um, and so we have we know that companies need to change as well in order to keep up. Um, we've moved through the age of manufacturing, distribution, information, and we're now in the age of the customer, us. Um, and that the age of the customer is defined by a company's ability to in, to keep up with an increasingly empowered and powerful customer uh, and to keep them happy and engaged. So companies know that they need to adapt to this new environment. Um, and what they're telling us, let me make sure I can click forward, um, is in order to do so, they, they want to better leverage data and, and analytics in their business decision making. They know that it's not enough to just paint racing stripes on the bug and expect it to go faster. Um, they need to really change their business. They need to know their customers in order to, to, to better serve them. They need to really know and understand their operations in order to improve them. So they, they've, they're realizing and telling us that, that using data in it to improve those business decisions uh, is important to them. But it's not just about their own internal data. It's, it's also about an ability to expand the use of external data. So bringing in social media data or bringing in weather data, or bringing in data from third parties and partners. Um, and so using all that data to become more insights driven. Um, and at Forrester, we've defined an insights driven business as one that um, systematically harnesses their data to improve processes, to better serve their customers, and to create differentiation in the market and competitive advantage. And that's a, a really tall order. That's, it's not easy to do. Um, so for, for many companies, it, it, it actually is very hard to do. Um, we asked uh, in a, one of our Forrester um, business technographic surveys, we asked business users who are looking for help with analytics how quickly their IT departments turn around a series of requests, different kinds of requests. Um, and so you can see here that the tech teams typically struggle um, to turn these around quickly. And so we asked them, um, 
whether they got the, the, ret the request returned around within days, within weeks, um, those are the answers that I have here, um, or within months and years. Um, and so even just the basic generating new data reports from existing data, 23% said they got those within days, 25% within weeks, the rest were within months and years. Um, and as you can see, as you go down the list of these different types of requests, they become increasingly complex where you get to the bottom and it's implementing and supporting new business intelligence um, and advanced analytic technologies. Um, up just above that is sourcing of new, new data sets. And when you get to those more complex requests, you find that only 10, 11% are able to turn those around within days, 21, 24% within months. And so for the vast majority of those types of requests, it's months and years. And if you're in a highly competitive market, waiting months and years for, for insights into something that will dramatically potentially change your business or change your strategy, that's too long. Some of your competitors will likely have gotten, gotten there first. So one of the strategies that we've seen that companies are taking is to bring in new data leadership. And we're seeing this proliferate across, um, across industries, across company sizes. And here you can see a, a selection of some of the titles that we've captured, um, VP of Data, Chief Data Officer, Chief Analytics Officer, Head of Insights. But I focus my research on the CDO because while it's not a new role, um, Capital One, the bank, appointed its first CDO in about 2002. So it's been around for about 16 years. However, one of the things that we've seen in talking to CDOs and surveying CDOs, um, despite the fact, you know, including the fact that there are now many more of them, is that that role is changing as well. So in our Forrester Technographic Survey, we've asked about, we ask over 3,000 companies, um, what their plans are for appointing a chief data officer. And this year we saw the CDO really cross the chasm. 51% of firms that we surveyed told us that they had appointed a chief data officer. Another 18% told us that they were um, planning to appoint a chief data officer. Uh, and that was pretty consistent across small, medium business and, and enterprises. You can see here 46% of SMBs, 53% of enterprises. A little bit of variation across the industries that you see on the right-hand side. 62% um, within utilities and telecom, um, varying you know, as you go down. Um, the, the, the laggard here is really the public sector and healthcare, which we had grouped in, the, in this particular survey. Um, but one of the interesting things that we found in another survey that we did, we just recently did an online survey of just CDOs, um, and one of the things that we found most interesting was over two-thirds of those CDOs that we surveyed um, had been appointed in the past two years. So what that says to me, for, for those who haven't appointed a CDO, it's, it's not too late. People are, you, you, we're still seeing new CDOs uh, come in, you know, be appointed. But also in places where there have been CDOs, um, there's been a turnover. We've seen a, an evolution of the role. And so one of the things that we wanted to dig into was what are people bringing CDOs in to do? Um, and so we asked um, what, what are the factors that contributed to the creation of this role? Uh, so as you can see here, competitive challenges and a drive for differentiation using data, which corresponds back to our, our definition of being an insights-driven business, um, was the number one answer. Um, of course, data governance and management is, is really important. It came in second. But four out of the, the top five answers here were about better business insights, digital transformation requirements, the need for a C-level champion for data and analytics, um, and that differentiation answer. So what we found was it is really business goals that are driving the creation uh, the, of, of a chief data officer role within organizations. And that's really a significant change um, from some of the, C the early CDOs that we ha we've been talking to over time. Um, and what we can see here in this, in this slide is um, 
what we've defined is the data value chain. And so we use this as a, as a reference point for understanding, not architecturally or really even sequentially, but what are the functions that a, that a, that a CDO uh, performs within the organization. Um, and it lays out those functions um, as, in, in, a, in an order, I guess, if you will. Um, and so what we found is that CDOs used to spend a lot more time on the left-hand side. Um, we identified CDOs who were very focused on data management, data governance. Often they were appointed because of a concern about data security, concern about a data breach, or a competitor has had a data breach and they didn't want to be uh, in the same boat. Um, so they were focused on cleaning and, and securing and potentially you know, regulatory concerns. However, more recently what we've seen um, particularly with this drive to be insights driven is that there's more emphasis on data use. Um, and there's a quote that I like that Thomas Edison said, the value of an idea lies in the using of it. And really the same goes for data there. Um, but what, what many have also pointed out to me is this quote you see in the bottom right hand corner, um, that data still does matter, data matter, and, and some would argue that data matters more than algorithms. None of this matters if your data is a mess. Um, so data will remain the competitive ed, ed differentiator, not the algor algorithm. It's the data. The data reflects the history of the organization. Now, that, that's certainly true, um, but we do need to keep in mind that quote from Thomas Edison. And I think there's a little bit of a lag in my slides here. Um, that the value of an idea lies in the using of it. So what we've seen is the, the CDOs that we're talking to, many of the CDOs, not all of them, but many of the CDOs that we're talking to today um, are focused on data exploration, data act, taking the action based on the, the data and the insights that are derived from it, um, and innovating with data. Um, and actually, data innovation can be anywhere across that value chain, but we've used that here to signify data sharing, participating in the data economy, potentially creating a, a data product or service. Um, and those who focus on this side of the, 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 the value chain emphasize that, um, you know, the goal isn't just to create a huge data lake, but it is to solve business problems using the data. Data management and quality will be the byproduct of a rich analytics practice. So bringing those two together, obviously they're very important, but we've seen this shift to um, a much greater emphasis on ensuring that the data is being put to use in the organization. Um, and the, the, the I was just going to say the simple formula that I use is that it's, it's data plus use uh, that equals value. So Stephanie, do you have a question? I do have a, a question that's come in. There was someone who was interested in um, finding out a little bit more about how organizations are maybe changing their approach to finding the truly key data sets that would differentiate themselves from competitors. Are, is there evidence of firms that are have found a, a silver bullet to identifying the, the most impactful data sets? <laughs> or, or how are folks approaching that body of work? Is, is there evolution in the market from that perspective? Well, so what, in talking to the CDOs, um, what we've heard from many is that, um, you know, they, they often start their tenure within an organization um, by going on a listening tour. And it's not a question of saying to their business colleagues, um, you know, the lines of heads of the lines of business or their fun functional, you know, heads of fun different functions. They're not going to them and saying, what data sets do you need? What do you need from me as a CDO? They're really, it, it's a listening tour where they're asking about their business and they're asking about the things that keep them up at night. Um, and so what we find is they, they then take those business problems um, or challenges and, and work to identify the data sets that will advance those particular challenges. Um, so it, it's a it's a it's an outside it's more of an outside in approach to uh, prioritizing data sets and prioritizing use cases. It's asking who those who are essentially the the customers of the CDO, uh, those internal decision makers, what kinds of challenges they have, what kinds of questions they want to ask, and then helping them identify those data sets. So it's not. Um, 
you know, it's not something that would be common across an, a, a, you know, across all companies. It's really contextual in terms of how they can improve their business. And they get that by really polling, if you will, or listening to their business colleagues. Um, so let me, I, I actually have a slide later on that talks about who they, who CDOs see as their customers internally. So we'll get there. Um, so this, this data here is a question that we asked specifically of this online survey that we did. We asked them how they allocated their time across that data value chain. Um, and as you can see, there's been some, we asked them, um, how they allocated their time in the past 12 months and how they anticipated their time being allocated in the next 12 months. So you can see here that we have identified some shifts in how they spend their time, or at least how they anticipate spending their time. Um, so whereas, uh, and here we're seeing the mean, so whereas last, you know, in the last 12 months, um, the CDOs on average spent 24% of their time in data management, they anticipate that that will be only 17% next in the next year. Um, data governance dropped a little bit in terms of the time spent. Things that increased are data discovery, a significant jump in analytics, measurement and evaluation, um, and embedding those insights into um, or automating the, uh, into processes um, or delivering them to, to, to decision makers um, in the, at the time of decisions. So one of the interesting things also that um, dropped is uh, reporting dash and, and dashboards. And I think in part because that is something that they really did spend a lot of time on before, kind of more of a classic BI type of approach. And now they're seeing that the demands for their re the resources that they control shifting kind of up stack, if you will, to a more, more advanced analytics. Um, I was also interested to see that this commercialization dropped as well. Um, Frankly, I'm not sure how I can explain that <laughs> because we see um, a, a, a significant uptick in interest in in how to innovate with your data, how to create new data products and and services um, that could then be offered to existing customers or or could be used to uh, drive a new revenue uh, revenue stream. Um, so this was the question that I mentioned, where we asked, um, you know, who are your who are your primary customers? Um, and we, again, we asked the question um, internally, or so, sorry, in the past 12 months, who did you see as your customers? Uh, in the next 12 months, who who do you see as your customers? Um, and again, we saw some some differences. So we see an increase in the CEO. Um, and other corporate strategy leaders. We see an increase in the chief digital officer, um, actually a pretty significant increase in the chief digital officer, and in chief customer officers. Um, CDOs that we surveyed expect to see IT less as a customer. Um, and there I wanted to point out, it's not necessarily that they expect to spend less time with them or maybe work less with them on, on data issues, but they see them less as a customer. Um, uh, perhaps spending less time on IT, you know, IT performance analytics and more time on business types of problems. They also say they're going to spend less time in sales, which I think is interesting. Uh, my explanation for that is because sales likely dominated the CDO with requests for help in prioritizing prospects and, and better targeting their resources. And they were probably much more vocal than others in doing that. <laughs> um, so the, the next thing we asked is, um, is what kinds of services did you offer to, I'm sorry, I'm slowing down here because I'm it, we're a little bit of a delay in, in uh, the advancement of the slides here. Um, we're seeing, so we asked them what kinds, what types of support do you provide to your internal, um, your internal customers? There we go. Um, and so, as you can see here, um, you know, think, keeping in mind that they're 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 working more closely with the CEO, the chief digital officer, et cetera. The number one was to enable the use of the data, and again, that's consistent with what we have seen as the shift. Um, but they're focusing on data prep, access to data catalogs, and access to self-service tools. Um, they also help source internal data. Um, and a vast majority of them participate in the selection of, of vendors and services providers. 
and a number of the, the other services that you see, you know, support that you see up, up here at the top, um, is services that that really reflect um, what I see as a coordination role, reviewing data and analytics practices, um, assessing data strategies, reviewing data governance. Um, we're really seeing the CDOs take on this role uh, of coordinating data and analytics activities across the organizations. Um, many of the CDOs that we speak to, uh, they work to embed their teams into the business uh, and really develop an insights-driven culture across the organization. Jennifer, there's another good question that's come in that's just asking for your, your point of view on, on whether it's the question is whether it's feasible for a firm to have a, a CIO, a chief analytics officer, and a CDO at the same time, um, and are those roles complementary, um, or are they competitive, or do do companies really need to invest in a, in a chief data officer as, as the lead role? Um, I think the individual is interested in a little bit of, of, of perspective right. as maybe they sort that out in their own organization. Right. So one of the questions that we did ask in this survey, and I'm happy to follow up with anyone after after the fact, we asked um, how the different roles interacted, um, and we asked about um, you know, it, it, we ha we thought long and hard about how we were going to word that question. You know, we didn't want to say is your relationship hostile <laughs> or is it productive um, or neutral in between. So we asked about whether or not there was. Um, uh, uh, overlap in the in the um, you know in the functions um, that there were clear division of labor, clear division of of, of responsibilities, or that it was evolving. Um, so it was overlap, evolving, clear division, um, and so that's so I, I have you know the relationships between a CDO and a CAO, a CIO, CIO, et cetera, across different or roles of the organization. Because um, even in things like customer insights, you know, the, the uh, CDOs have often take, taken over or are, are responsible for customer insights in an organization, um, but sometimes the chief marketing officer might feel that that's their domain. Um, and so what we found was there is significant overlap um, or an evolving um, division of labor between CIO, CAO, and, and CDO, with the D here being data, not digital. Um, and so what we found is, it, 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 so the, the division between a CIO and a CDO, uh, or what I call data leadership, because I kind of, I often lump those together, a chief analytics officer, chief data officer, um, that division with the CIO is becoming clearer. Um, maybe initially there was some um, there it, it was there was some uncertainty as to how the different roles would play out. Um, but really, as the CDO, the data officer, has moved more up stack and is more of a, a role that coordinates insights across the organization, obviously using the data, um, but applying the, the, the analytics practices to that. Um, that. That has helped create that or, or um, clarify the division of labor between this with the CIO. Obviously, they need to work very closely together because the chief data officer is going to be very dependent on the CIO for helping get data out of those systems on which they're dependent. Um, but then looking at the CAO, CDO, um, division of labor. I've seen organizations where they have both and they divide them very, you know, there are strict divisions of labor between them. Manu Life, which is an insurance company um, in, uh, in Canada, they have both a CAO and a CDO. Um, and the CAO is very um, analytics oriented, manages a data science team, and the CDO is very res is much is is responsible for the data management and governance. Um, others would say they all need to be under the same roof. Um, so the chief data officer of Travelers Insurance is now the chief data and analytics officer. So we're seeing, um, you know, with this evolution of the role that I'm describing here, we're also seeing some of those CDOs get the A assigned to them as well. Um, but th from an organizational perspective, we've really seen all, all, all forms 
of organizations. Um, I think what's the most important thing is to really conceptualize having this, this center of excellence, if you will, um, and having the resources assigned to it that, that will ensure its success. Um, so a, a, I often refer to them as, as you know, data and analytics leaders, uh, because like I showed in that word cloud in the beginning, there is a, a vast range of titles. Um, and the importance is not the title, it's the function that they serve within their organization. So very long-winded answer, <laughs> which really boils down to it depends. And, but, and clearly yeah. something that you're passionate about. I, and there's a lot <laughs> of um, questions that are coming in on this topic. We could spend just a few more minutes. I think um, your answer sure. set off a, a couple of questions of, of who reports to who. Does the CDO report to the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer? Um, and, and they're asking specifically maybe in the, the chief data officers that you, you interviewed in that sample that you have, um, if you can provide a little bit more flavor if you, if you know those answers. Yeah. Um, so what we've seen, it, it's interesting. So in our broader survey, um, the, the Forester's Business Technographics, what we found was um, last year it was about 30% reporting to the CEO, about 30% reporting to the CIO, and another 30% mixed across chief finance officer, chief marketing officer, uh, the CISO, or chief risk officer, um, so kind of a, a, a mix of some of the other roles. Um, this year, so that was 2016. This year in 20, or I guess it was last year at this point, 2017, we saw about 40% reporting to the CEO. So we saw a, a reflection in that survey of the shift to a more strategic role in the organization. Um, and then, you know, probably 40%, and then I think it was 20, 25% who reported to the CIO, and then the mix of the rest. Um, but but when we actually spoke to many CDOs, some who'd been in their role for a number of years, we found they bounced around a lot. Um, so they might have first reported to the CIO. Um, one one CDO in particular at a bank um, that we've been speaking to for a number of years now, she first reported to the CIO, and then she was actually put under um, an enterprise architecture role, and then she bounced out and reported to the chief risk officer, and now she's in an organization um, that reports into the CEO. We've also seen them under the COO, so a, you know more of a chief operating officer, a lot of with a lot of focus around performance. Um, so there's a wide range, but the the transition, the shift that we've seen has been consistent with the. Uh, you know, with the conclusions that we've presented here, that that role is shifting to more of a strategic position within the organization. So I hope well, that. Thanks for answering that, Jennifer. I appreciate it. We'll we'll no have problem. other questions at the end if there's uh, there's there's more to dive into on this this topic. So uh, please uh, please proceed on with the slides that you have. Okay, great. Um, so here I just wanted to give um, a couple of examples of how the CDOs uh, that we've been speaking to are coordinating really a more of an enterprise-wide insights function. So um, at, at Sanofi, the CDO, he, he was focused on, he said he recognized that understanding data and en enabling its use requ requires breaking down those silos. So he has a group of data scientists he has a data team um, that report into him, but he, like this listening tour that I mentioned early on, he wanted to get his team out into the field, so he put them on what he called a rep ride to the different hospitals and clinics to really help them understand the context of the business. Um, at La Redoute, which is a retailer here in France, um, data, the data analysts and data scientists, they're it, they are embedded in each department. Um, but the CDO's office, they take on more of that centralizing role, um, or uh, we often tend to say coordinating because central, some people don't like the word centralizing, it sounds too authoritarian. Um, but really uh, more of a coordinating role of data management and, and facilitating that data exploration um, and helping to share those best practices across the organization. Um, Similarly, at Citizens Bank, we're seeing that kind of um, that kind of coordination role. The CDO being responsible for data governance and technology, um, but they do have a CDO-sponsored 
uh, center of excellence where they offer services uh, to help enable the business analysts across other teams. Um, and then at Macy's, Macy's was an interesting one because they have um, the, their business intelligence and ad advanced analytics functions are siloed across the organization, but they've started a new role um, at, at Center of Excellence under their CTO, um, which was created to help share learnings and to start to drive the coordination of those activities, um, and in particular, standardization of data definitions, key performance indicators, um, and the technologies across them. So there's this effort to really rationalize and coordinate those activities across the organization. And often the, the CDO is at the center of those efforts. Um, so there's this just obvious type of hub and spoke type of um, organizational structure, but we see this, this insight center of excellence um, at the center. Um, and and with with Folks going out into, or you know, connections going out into each of the lines of business, um, any of the regional organizations, also functional organizations, so HR, legal, um, other functional organizations, um, but really seeing this as a coordinating mechanism for for bringing together and for sharing best practices. Um, it's not always a formal team, or not necessarily a formal team or organizational structure, but really a way of operating that enables that kind of coordination, the standardization, standardization resource sharing, um, and the best practices and knowledge sharing. Um, and through and through this, we're seeing CDOs increasingly um, really deliver business value. Uh, and these are just a couple of examples here um, and, and some quotes that I thought were really interesting from some of the CDOs about how they're delivering business values. So it's they're driving those transformation, the transformation to an insights-driven business. Um, they're helping to harness that data and apply that analytics to create the differentiation, the competitive advantage. So whether it's a project in improving sales prospecting or customer experience or streamlining processes, um, or even creating new revenue streams, which I mentioned earlier, we're seeing a number of CDOs who are doing that. Um, but these CDOs are delivering delivering business value. And one of the quotes that I that I just wanted to make sure I called out was. Um, the one from the CDO of this of a large French insurance provider, and we were asking about, you know, how is your, how are you measured, uh, you know, how are you gold as a as a CDO, and he says it's really simple, we're measured in terms of euros. It's about improving the bottom line, reducing time to process a request, or or improving fraud detection. He said we do, a, you know, we do a business case for each of the initiatives that we undertake, and we measure the returns. Um, and so it really just illustrates that CDOs today, they, they are taking on more, more of a strategic role. Um, they're really being looked to, to deliver business value back to the organization. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Stephanie, um, to talk about how data catalogs can, can serve as the foundation for these new insight centers of excellence and hopefully help coordinate some of those resources and maybe facilitate the standardization and, and that knowledge and, and best practice sharing. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. And there are plenty more questions coming in. We'll, we'll queue them up for the end of the, the presentation. And I know that Jennifer is also available uh, to answer questions through email after the event. So we'll make sure to share her contact information uh, with you in the follow-up materials to today's webinar if we don't get to all the questions. Um, I wanted to give a little, one of the questions that has come in is, who is Alation? I want to give you a little bit more background um, on Alation and just so that um, you'll know uh, how to, um, to place in perspective um, the second half of the, of the presentation. Um, Alation is actually a, a vendor of data cataloging solutions. And so we've seen over the last couple of years an increase in demand for data catalogs as one of the solutions that chief data officers are putting in place to help them transform the culture of their organizations and manage their data environment. Um, so the, the Examples that I'm going to share are going to get a little bit more um, real, where we have some screenshots of what are some of the systems that chief data officers have in place to help them manage through this transition. Um, I also want to just let folks know that um, I have a, a reduced sample size relative to, to Jennifer, while Jennifer's research is survey-based and uh, much more broad-based across thousands of respondents. Um, Alation works uh, with uh, hundreds of, of customers. Um, so 
I'll, uh, I'll share my perspective and um, you can um, keep that in mind as, as we go through the second half of the, of the content. Um, so from an elation perspective, why is a data catalog becoming a more important component of a, a chief data officer's technology stack? Um, what we've seen not only through um, Jennifer's research at, at, at Forrester, but also through other third-party analysts that we work with, is that the demand for data catalogs over the last two years as a technology component of a data-driven organization has spiked. And um, if I look at the reasons why, and as um, I go out into the field and work with customers um, like eBay and, and Wells Fargo and Tesco and um, Yahoo Japan, we, we do have a global presence. The reasons why fall into these four categories most often. Um, number one, there is often a, a, a shift in the organization towards providing um, greater data access to a broader number of individuals, so a trend toward data democratization, um, if you would. Um, and so in order to be able to support self-service analytics, organizations are, are finding that they need to uh, be able to offer simple tooling for data access. They need to take what were um, technical inventories of data and turn those into uh, more living recommendation systems or data catalogs that actually help guide maybe new users of data um, to find insights. The second trend we're seeing um, in these organizations that we work with um, is an interest in, in really changing the culture by creating a good foundation for interpreting data and sharing the nuances um, of interpretation of data across a broader audience. Um, we see organizations that are um, putting more formal data stewardship programs in place um, to share knowledge around data and trying to create a foundation of literacy about what are different techniques in, an in analytics and how should those be interpreted and really helping their um, user base make um, more advanced decisions. Uh, around how they apply the output of analysis to actually uh, actual business decision making. Um, a third trend I, I think might be a, a little bit more obvious to folks, and that's a trend toward um, evolving data governance and data management best practices um, to not only cover compliance requirements, but also to govern data for improved insights. So sharing best practices, um, reuse of um, queries, reuse of filters, reuse of, of data preparation um, techniques across the organization. So there's more consistency in how everyone is manipulating um, and applying the data to business decision making, and thus there's more trust um, in those processes as well as um, confidence um, that um, any regulatory concerns um, are being adhered to. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit today uh, about how um, the ability to value information um, with infonomics techniques is just starting to take off in the market from our perspective um, and how some of the leading chief data officers are, are really investing quite a bit of time there and getting systems in place to be able to um, more accurately manage their data environments based on evaluation of the data assets they have under, under management. Um, so I'm going to share a, an example um, of uh, a customer from our, our customer base for each one of these different different trends um, and um, give you a sense of, of what the day and the life is of some of these organizations that are leveraging data catalogs as a technology solution to help support some of these initiatives. And the first, the first customer I'd like to speak about is the, the city of San Diego. So as Jennifer mentioned, one of the um, industry verticals that has been slow to uh, adopt or bring on board chief data officers relative to other industry verticals um, is the public sector. Um, and I, I think for just that reason, the city of San Diego has, has stood out as, as a, a leader in their chief data officer program. Um, we work closely with Maxime Pachersky, who was one of the first chief data officers for the, for the city. And what this screenshot is, is uh, one of the initial projects that he took on in um, collaboration with the, the mayor of San Diego. Um, anyone who has, has, has maybe traveled to San Diego or has uh, friends that, that live there, um, San Diego city streets um, have 
traditionally not been very well maintained. And so um, the mayor, Kevin uh, Falconer, um, uh, leveraged that um, challenge as one of his um, campaign um, commitments to the citizens of San Diego that he would repave um, the streets of San Diego during um, his time as, as, as leader in that, that city. Um, now, what that meant was giving citizens some transparency to, to hold the government and the mayor accountable to that campaign uh, promise. And so as Maxime Pacherski entered uh, the role as one of the first CDOs of the city of San Diego, he was given an opportunity um, to, to help provide that transparency through an open data initiative. So this is the... Um, an example screenshot of a publicly accessible website um, that provides a visualization of uh, how many city streets have been paved uh, over the last couple couple years. And this is updated uh, on, a, on a regular basis with an automated uh, process that's now uh, in place. Um, what Maxime used to start to organize the city around this initiative um, was a number of different technologies, one of those being uh, a, a data catalog, and, and um, they are a customer of, of Alations. Um, the data catalog actually helped Maxime get a handle on the initial inventory of where city street information was stored across hundreds of different databases that were available uh, to the city. And what he was, was able to do with a data catalog that automated connectivity and the initial inventory um, of those different data storage systems was identify about 319 tables that were critical to city streets information. And so the data catalog automated some of that work um, for um, the chief data officer's office so that um, time was freed up to then reach out to different stakeholders of those data stores, as well as subject matter experts within the city who understood the calculations and definitions um, behind that data, uh, those data repositories. Um, so after, after quite a bit of, of work and kind of wrangling over the, uh, the, the calculations um, behind that very elegant elegant dashboard that we saw a, a few um, minutes ago, um, the city was able to, um, with confidence, release open data um, to um, their citizen base. And today, um, the city has been able to release um, about 46% of the high value data sets um, that they have internally. They've been able to re release those and publish those publicly, increasing this trend of transparency beyond just city streets um, data to many other um, data assets that the city has, has access to. Um, so it was the foundation of a, a data catalog um, that helped the city create this culture where um, data is managed as, a, as an asset, it's inventoried as an asset, and that's done automatically. Um, city employees are encouraged to share their knowledge of the data um, through this application that's a data catalog so that they're having deeper conversations on the nuances um, and then the data itself can be distributed for, for broad use in a more automated way. And they took some data processing routines that were taking 10 to 20 hours monthly down to a three second process every night um, by organizing that data through uh, a data catalog. Um, so this is one example of how a data catalog is not a solution, but is a um, important supporting component in changing the culture um, of an organization. Um, and here's a, a, a screenshot that shows you what a catalog page looks like. Um, you see a, a number of those 319 tables outlined here with simple titles, um, some technical information around columns, and then I think most interestingly, a rank order um, of popularity of those tables. And that popularity metric is actually um, being automatically calculated by the data catalog um, by looking at query logs that indicate where is this data being um, used in actual active um, analytic queries and, and searches throughout the organization. Um, and so this is a, a small, um, small snapshot um, of just how, um, how um, simple some of these communications can be to, to change the, the culture of, um, of some of these organizations. The second example um, I'd, I'd like to share is um, from an insurance company 
and so um, this organization, of course, was very advanced in their usage of, of analytics, hundreds of actuaries uh, on staff. Um, the organization is Munich Reinsurance, and so as an, a reinsurer, one of the important um, competitive ad advantages um, for Munich Reinsurance is to look for um, new risk products um, that could be developed out of the data sets that they have. So they're looking for macroeconomic, um, how to balance out macroeconomic risk um, or natural disaster risk with risk products they can, new risk products they can bring to the market. And an important part of their transformation as an organization was to move away from a world of um, database-oriented analysis to a more agile world of um, file structure and Hadoop-based analysis. And yet their biggest challenge in, in doing that wasn't um, particularly the technology, it was getting those hundreds of actuaries to start working with a new data stack and data infrastructure. Um, and as anyone who has, has worked in the um, Hadoop community might know, um, the interfaces to Hadoop um, can feel very, very nascent if you're used to a, a mature database and business intelligence environment. And so in this case, the data catalog for, for Wolfgang Hauner, their chief data officer, the data catalog became the face of that data lake. It became a portal that um, could be rolled out to um, not only um, actuaries, but other analysts and business users um, at uh, Munich Reinsurance to lower the, the risk or the challenge of accessing data in this, in this new um, storage framework. And so Alation became um, this portal of the lake that could um, make proactive data recommendations, share and automate um, data sets um, in, the, in the data lake, um, and activate users to have a, a more collaborative approach um, to data-oriented projects. And the last example I'll share is a company that's been a, a long time customer of, of Alation's. Um, and Zohair Kari, the, the chief data officer there, um, interacted with Alation um, in our early days as he saw the opportunity for a data catalog to really put um, a little bit more of a focus on um, best practices and distributing those throughout the organization. And so he had this, this observation um, as an individual that had a, a background in data governance, um, that you can have the best data governance policies in place, but if um, a well-meaning uh, product manager queries some, some data, pulls it out of the database, and puts it in Excel, those data governance practices and, and policies are, are, are broken. Um, by pulling data out of the um, place that it's being stored, the manipulation of that data then is, is hard to track. You lose all, all lineage. And so most of the data decisions he observed at eBay were being made through Excel and PowerPoint um, and leading to um, situations that could put eBay at, at, at risk for uh, mismanaging um, PII data or, or data that, that should be under financial data that should be under regulation. And um, what he decided to do with eBay as, a, as a, an organization with his team was to begin to look at different ways to solve this issue of data governance. How could you govern data for insight and provide proactive recommendations in addition to managing to um, compliance? Um, and um, they tried several times to, to build an internal system um, to engage the user community um, in this type of collaborative um, data management activity and um, found in Alation a solution um, that um, had the right level of, of end user engagement through the elegance and simplicity of, of design and some of the, um, some of the curation um, techniques that, that we use in the product. So it, at eBay today, about 1,000 users are logging into Alation on a weekly basis. And as they increase their analytics community, include not just data scientists and analysts, but also product managers who are A-B testing in the environment, um, they're increasing that footprint to over 3,000 um, users this, this year. And here's a, a simple screenshot of another part of the product, in this case, a business glossary um, with assignments, formal assignments of stewards um, to managing and making sure that um, this business glossary is updated on a regular 
basis and doing the human work required to create um, understanding of, of the nuance of some of these terms so that everyone can be um, speaking on the same page around analytics. So those are a couple of examples of, um, of implementations in the, in the wild and chief data officers um, that have uh, adopted uh, Alation in, in a variety of different um, programs and initiatives they have kicked off. Um, as I mentioned today, we won't be able to get into a, a ton of detail around um, the, the future and what we see coming for chief data officers um, around the valuation of data and infonomics. Um, but we've been on the, the forefront of being able to work with a handful of organizations um, in using a data catalog as a technology to actually quantify how are analytics and data being associated with key business decisions? How do you quantify that in a, a, a system that you can use to then support trade-off decisions between risk and, and opportunity as you manage data and understand um, what level of investment to make in, in different data assets? Um, and this slide gives you a sense of what that might look like in, um, in the data catalog itself at the bottom right-hand side. You see some of those calculations being presented relative to a, a, a table that's in use by a team of, of analysts so that they have a sense of the full context of this particular data set. And so I, I think as we, we wrap today, we have a, a few minutes just left for, um, for questions, um, but I wanted to um, you know, share with the, the audience that I think we're at a very exciting time in the evolution of data-driven organizations. Um, not only from a, a technology perspective, but as Jennifer has, has spoken to from a perspective of um, what opportunities there are ahead for chief data officers and how they can transform the data um, usage culture at their, their organizations through one of these use cases or um, you know, many more that we see across uh, our, our client base. Um, if you are interested in more information, I know that we will not get to all the questions that have um, been queued up here in the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, Jennifer has written a, a, a body of, of research that we would love to give you access to. Um, you can go to the Lation website and um, download this report uh, free of charge. Um, and I understand from Jennifer, there are a couple of reports coming in the next couple of weeks on some of the statistical information she shared with us from the surveys uh, today. So uh, we will also be following up with folks um, with um, email communications over the next couple of weeks with access to, to those reports as well. And if you're interested in a, a demonstration of Alation as an example of a data catalog, we'd be happy to accommodate that at this link as well. So I think that we have room for maybe two questions, which is which is hard, Jennifer, because there's so many that are queued up. <laughs> um, but I think one person has been very uh, patiently waiting uh, on a on a question that um, I I'd love to address. She she asks, um, how are organizations and, and chief data officers in particular um, balancing the use of data with the risk of retaining or keeping data um, that you know, that may be, may be private or, or the risk of, of uh, even storing that data set may increase over time instead of disposing it. So, you know, many big data initiatives have in the market have recommended or data science teams have recommended just store everything and you'll figure out what to do with it later. What happens for a CDO when there's a risk associated with that, the actual storage of that information? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> that's, yeah, <laughs> maybe a hard um, one. I, I can go on to an yeah. easier one. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I think it's an important question, and particularly with the implementation of the GDPR coming up in 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 May of this year, it's it's an increasingly um, important question. Um, you know, the penalties for violation are are potentially enormous. Um, and so I, I think a couple of things. I mean, clearly, if the data is, you know, has PII. Um, is potentially subject to the GDPR. It's obviously got to be treated with utmost care. Um, I think I mean, one of the things that we're seeing, um, however, is that um, there is a lot more that can be done with the data than um, is often thought because there's, you know, and often there's a, a bigger perception of what the, 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 the restriction is. Um, and I live in Europe and, and, 
even you know here in Europe in the European Commission, um, there's a concern that the the perceptions are often more restrictive than than the law itself actually is. Um, we could you know debate that all day long, um, but that's one thing that I just wanted to throw out. Um, but there, I mean, clearly there, if there is personal information, the, the data has to be treated with utmost care. But there is a lot of data within an organization um, that it doesn't have PII that, you know, particularly as you know, we're seeing an up, uptick in um, implementation and exp experimentation, ex implementation of IoT. Um, and, and clearly, newly instrumented devices are generating a ton of data that can that can bring value to the business and, and to business decisions. Um, so I would say, obviously, you know, that has to be part of the assessment. What 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 the potential risk is and the risk of storing it, uh, a data you know data set is. Um, but there's a lot of data out there that is is not necessarily risky or risks you know non-compliance. Um, so definitely include that in, in, as part of the evaluation of what to do with, with a data set. Um, but don't assume that, you know, that that, that risk is, um, don't, don't assume that, you, you know, there, that you can't do something with the data. Make sure you just evaluate it and, and look at it objectively. Great. Thank you. I'm going to sneak one more in just because there's been four or five people asking this. Um, and, and the, the, the questions are all along the lines of how does one transition to a role of CD, CDO? Um, are there any um, you know, learnings that, that you've had from interviewing a variety of CEOs that there's a, a path? Is it better to come from a data management background or a business intelligence um, background? Um, any any observations that, that you've had there in the market? Uh, so it's interesting. That was one of the questions that we asked. Um, that, that we asked the CDOs that we surveyed what what was their background and um, a little less than half it was you know forty something percent said that they were from I, an IT background um, but the, the other roles that they'd come from were were pretty diverse um, could be marketing could be sales could be business you know it could be a BI role a business analyst role. Um, but if we, w when we added up all of those other non-IT roles, um, that was a bigger percentage. Um, so I thought that was telling to see that, uh, you know, a larger, you know, the majority of them came from non-IT roles. Um, <clears throat> so that's in terms of the background. So really, I think it's, you know, o open, open season. Anybody could become a CDO. And one of the things that many of the CDOs that we spoke to told us is that, um, you know, some of them said that they were picked because they were non, you know, non-technical. Um, in their particular organization, they wanted somebody who came from the business. Uh, so we've seen them come from marketing. We've seen them come from um, finance. We've come, seen them come from a lot of different roles. Um, now, in terms of how to hit the ground running and how to start with their role, um, the the number one thing we heard from you know seasoned CDOs as well as new CDOs is um, is this idea of a listening tour that I mentioned earlier, really going around to their, their um, potential, you know, quote unquote customers um, within the organization, the, their, their, their partners, their business partners within the organization, and getting a, a better understanding of what kinds of things they were challenged by, what was keeping them up at night. Um, and that uh, really started to position the chief data officer as um, as someone who could support those business objectives, those the, the you know the the business needs of the the different the different groups within the organization. Um, so that listening tour was really key to to the to getting you know to to hitting the ground running. Um, one of the reports that Stephanie mentioned earlier is a report on um, ten steps to uh, you know. The, your first hundred days, or whatever, whatever, whatever your time frame, the first five months, um, it, it's really about what are the things that a CDO needs to do to be successful, and it lays it out in in ten steps. Excellent. Well, it, it sounds from all of the interaction that we've had on online today that there are a lot of folks who are actively thinking about this as, as maybe a career path um, or a, a role for their organization, and so. I'd love to thank all of the attendees for spending time with us today. Jennifer, thank you so much for your, um, your insights. 
um, and your your research, and and we'll I think we'll all be looking forward to um, many reports to come as as we learn how this role is is changing in organizations uh, going forward. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for asking me to join. Thank you. Until next time, um, we'll we'll leave you and. Um, Look in your inbox for um, follow-up information and today's webinar to share with your colleagues. Thank everyone for attending. We appreciate it.